abstract that I sent in, it mentions um, looking at the depth distribution and how that influences starting strength at rest. It's not something I'm going to talk about. It's something that my advisor has slipped in and edit um, to my chapter uh, thesis abstract, um, which I just copied from this. So I have to talk to him about that one. Uh, the data aren't, aren't in this talk, but yeah, I will be talking about target strength variability for mysis, the effect of lake and year, and of course, size. We have a decade of data in six lakes, so that's pretty cool. What are mysids? I think everyone here in the room knows what a mysid is, so I'm just going to, uh, I just put the picture up in case there was anyone who didn't. Um, there are a large proportion of the crustaceans outlined in biomass in the Great Lakes and Finger Lakes. In Ontario, they were 33% in 2008. They're a major player in the food webs. They eat detritus, phytoplankton, zooplankton, eat themselves. They're preyed upon by their own competitors, um, forage fish, which would include things like alewife, like Ontario, one of the major predators of bisons there. Also things like bloater and sculpins, and uh, more prominently, so in the upper Great Lakes in Ontario. Um, they also compete with their own zooplankton prey for food with the algae. They transport nutrients and toxins throughout the system because they are migrators uh, vertically every day very great distances. And perhaps something that's more interest, interesting to people in this room, um, the oligotrophication of the recent uh, Great Lakes with the Clean Water Act has reduced the productivity and the total phosphorus uh, trophic state of the Great Lakes, which is something that has been correlated to mice and life histories and productivity in the past. And actually looking at some of that, we see some data indicating life history shifts due to uh, productivity, not necessarily in the Great Lakes, but indicating the difference. And so looking into the, whether or not there's been a shift over time soon. Uh, but if that's the case, um, yet again, not just because they're important, but because they might be changing and productivity might be dropping, that would be important for fishery managers to know whether they're thinking about bottom up or top down effects. So it's important to monitor them. And we look at their numbers through net samples seen uh, this done probably these are vertical conical nets towed through the water column you get net samples scattered throughout a lake very high quality demographic data not super high quality spatial data and it's important to get the spatial component because biomass varies with depth pretty strongly in bison's so acoustics is a really good way to get in between and get spatially extensive data works. I was using, using that to explain target strength to people that are part of This is our acoustic setup on the Guardian, which has since gone bad and we need to repair. Um, yeah, so you get the spatially extensive data and you also get spatially detailed data. You can see the x-axis um, is time and distance because the boat is moving. Y-axis is depth and we have a lot of different data points in here. You see the bottom of the lake, Ontario in 2013 here. Um, you can see a mycid layer, which is pretty characteristic at night, especially in a stratified time. You have a uh, thermocline where there's not many things hanging out. And then at the top, we have some zooplankton and turbulence, most likely. Um, but the question becomes turning this into a uh, meaningful biological number, which requires knowing the target strength and acoustic properties. I know, I know there's at least a few people here who know this what were the factors of sleep. Um, but you have your target strength in the linear form, uh, which if you divide that into the overall backscatter, you can get the density. It's really important to know your target strength. It's likely to be the most, uh, the most influential part of the uncertainty in your acoustic abundance estimates. And it's influenced by the size and shape of your organism, by its orientation, by its density and sound speed contrasts by maturity and by fat content of 
density contrast, uh, density contrast is what causes the sound to look back. Uh, that content obviously affects that maturity if you have a gravity female. She's going to reflect that more so. Also, you have to keep in the back of your mind equipment if you're seeing differences between two different surveys that might be that you calibrated something differently. Previous studies with this particular species mostly focus on Lake Ontario and Cayuga, and um, some of them have quite few data points. Uh, see the relationship here, we have backscatter on the x-axis, density on the y-axis, you see a lot of these graphs, because um, you're going to predict, hopefully, density from backscatter where you don't have in that sample. And there are data on this for several of these samples. But the problem is they're, um, they're mostly in just a couple of lakes. The studies aren't combined over lots of data sets. Um, so it would be nice to, since we have a lot of data, I've been working with target strength and acoustic data in Lake Ontario. Um, I know a lot of people who have data across the, the basin. We said, let's, let's get it all together. So a lot of people were really gracious and like, yeah, let's do this now. They're excited about it too. Um, so we have a decade of data, six lakes. We want to see that they match the theory just that they work together, that there's variability. Because we have all that, we also want to see um, if the scattering model is still pretty accurate, and how much average length, lake, and year will explain the variation that we see in, uh, in the target strength. The, the reason for that is that if you have a lot of year-to-year -year variability in target strength, you might be more inclined to get a lot of samples each year to ground truth your data have not so much variability, you might be less inclined, which would save on time and cost. And it's interesting to know if you have differences in lakes. Um, I had a lot of surveys. There's data that we collected actively, CSMI 2013 in Ontario. Um, actually, web in the back here, we were collecting data with Seneca in 2013. Um, Michigan CSMI. Kelly Leiste gave me, sorry, Kathy Leiste gave me data from Michigan and Superior, 2005. Michigan and Huron, 2008 through 13, from David Warner. Got published data from Ontario, 2005. These are all run some group papers here. Uh, Ontario, 2008 and Geneva, 2006. So we put that all together. Oh, get ahead of myself. Um, I think you guys know how it works to measure that sample, so I'm just going to pass that one up. Acoustic data, we uh, draw lines so that we're not including the bottom or anything above the mycid layer. Exclude out all the fish. Interpolate back in the mycid densities, which um, we can talk more about. That's a different step that wasn't included prior to what we did. Um, you want to take the data right from where your net is, of course. Find the amount of noise and the detection limit with your nets to get the right density. So here's what we got. I see a really nice correlation here. Um, the colors and shapes represent the different lakes involved in the study. And uh, has an R of about 0.69, so a pretty good correlation. Um, we also would expect from theory to see a slope of 0.1 in this relationship, and then the intercept is basically a proportion of the uh, target strength. So if you see differences there, that's what you're looking at as target strength. Um, oh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this is log density on the y-axis. So um, this dotted line is the one-to-one -one line. We did an ordinary least squared and uh, saw a slope smaller than one. Uh, sorry, not the one-to-one -one line, the theoretical line. And actually significantly different, which was causing Lars and I to scratch our heads for a little while. Um, and then I decided to flip the data around and progress it differently, and that's what happened. And we realized, yes, there is error in the SV estimate, so we need to use uh, range major axis um, estimation of the data. And it's not significantly different from so 0.1. So that was exciting, um, just like you'd expect. Um, scattering model accuracy, so we took the theoretical scattering model and um, predicted the amount of backscatter based on, this is the forward problem, predict the backscatter based on the size structure and the number of mice is there. 
and actually the model over predicts acoustic backscatter um, in most cases in this bias type, which means it's biased for higher target strengths than we would expect. However, um, the relationship is not significantly different from a one-to-one -one slope. So that's encouraging to look at what's actually causing that higher target strength. There's the variability in the, um, so taking a step back from the scattering model now to look at the, uh, the log density versus the SV data again. Um, if you take the residuals to the theoretical line, what you'll have is a scattering of target strength deviations, um, which, which means because the slope of the line is supposed to be point 0.1 and then any intercept is target strength, if you just move the line up and down, you're seeing differences in target strength. So we, we take these residuals and plot them, we see how target strength differs plot that versus average length, which you would expect to be the main influencer of target strength. And you do see a negative correlation um, in a relationship. And if you also account for a lake, you see differences in the lakes, which is interesting. Um, and the way it works out is Huron, Ontario, Michigan, and Seneca pretty much fall into the same group. And Superior and Cayuga are way down below. What that means is down here you're getting more acoustic return per mycid because you're seeing less mycid than you expect. Which, um, so more acoustic return for their size, and that could maybe be caused by condition or maybe behavior if they're orienting themselves somewhat differently. Um, so that's an interesting result which may have something to say about the ecology um, of the different systems. Looking at the interannual variability, we can do that in Michigan and Ontario because that's where we have data. Basically, this data set was different from, depending on the way you looked at it, from just these two or all of them. Um, but you can get a sense for the variability just looking at it there. In Ontario, there's no change. Um, of course, there are fewer years involved, but there's also more data points uh, each year. So it looks like within a given year, there's more variability than what you see between years most of the time. Although there's that one year in Michigan that seems to be out there. I also took a look at the deviation in, uh, so this is similar to the other plot where we're looking at the deviation in uh, the target strengths versus the average length, except here what I have is the expected number of mycids predicted from the model. So what that would do, rather than the other version, is account for the nonlinearities in the relationship between mycid size and target strength. So you would expect this to be a tighter fit. Did the same work actually got a slope going the other direction, but you still see the same separation of those two lakes. So that's an interesting result that seems to be consistent across uh, different ways of looking at the data. So conclusions, um, with a large quantity of data agreed, uh, we still found that it agreed with the theory and they tended to agree one with another and fall into a general relationship with a decent amount of correlation. Um, the scattering model does produce data that's correlated with reality, but it has a high target strength. And the average length explains most of the variation. Cuban superior have higher target strengths than the rest of the lakes, uh, even for the size of the mycids. And the interannual variation, uh, variation does not seem to be too, too significant, although obviously you still want to go out and uh, ground truth your data every year. I'd like to thank Lars, to thank my funders, and EPA, Glenn and Rick, um, and all the people who gave me data, and a couple of undergrads who helped me process some of the samples from CSMI. <laughs> and I'll take your questions. Size of female to number of roots. So that would imply um, 
where Seneca does. And Seneca and Cuba are obviously, if you're, if you're looking at productivity of the lake, they're far out on the right versus the four great lakes that we're looking at. Um, I guess I would expect median productivity, but it doesn't, doesn't seem to quite keep all of that. Um, that relationship, because instead you have Seneca who with the Great Lakes and Superior to hold out for Cuba. Um, you might expect to see food problems with talk to the content, 50% of having with the content data. Um, so I would expect it to be equality and or uh, productivity. If you have a higher growth rate, you might see different. Yeah. Yes. So I guess just kind of visualizing the existing data and I guess more statement. What's like the average density? It's a number of based off of your target strength data. Average biometric density? Yeah. Off the top of my head, between like one and three. One and three. Right. Uh, in the in the mice layer. <coughs> um, is there any way that you can capture that data as mice? At least like in Seneca, they really get concentrated as they migrate off. It might be from ground truth, but would that be the easier way to get? We are working, and still, still working with some other guys to get a machine to go out and actually just put it in the water and get some data um, just right next to the photographing at the same time as the acoustics. So you can see the length in there. Um, but yeah, it's kind of field crazy. Thank you. I think we're